Queens Public Library continues to celebrate its 125th anniversary. Don't forget to browse our book list and share your QPL story. For more information, visit qpl125.org. Begin 2022 with a library card. Get access to all of our materials, including books, ebooks, e-magazines, music, movies, and more. Our digital media options, which includes ebooks, music, and more, are available from anywhere with an internet connection. Try Hoopla, our new streaming service connecting you to movies, TV shows, and comics. Martin Luther King Jr. Day is on January 17th. To honor this civil rights icon, we have special programs and recommended reading. Visit queenslibrary.org to learn more and explore all of these opportunities. Welcome to the Queens Public Library's talk with Omar Sharif Jr., actor, model, activist, grandson of the Hollywood legend Omar Sharif, and the author of the 2021 memoir, A Tale of Two Omars, a memoir of family, revolution, and coming out during the Arab Spring. And Andre Asaman, the author of 13 novels and nonfiction books, including Call Me By Your Name, which was adapted into the Academy Award-winning motion picture, its sequel, Find Me, and the 1994 memoir, Out of Egypt. The New York Times wrote of Out of Egypt, Asaman has a marvelous eye for detail and a subtle sense of psychology. It is his great achievement that he has recreated a world gone forever now and given us an ironical and affectionate portrait of those who are exiled from it. The actor Alan Cummings said of Sharif Jr.'s memoir, this book is the fascinating and inspiring odyssey of one man's quest to be his authentic self. And Abdi Nazimian, author of Like a Love Story said of the work, it is an essential book that shines a much needed light on the intersection of Arab and queer identity. Hi, I'm Brian Alessandro. For those of you who don't know me, I have written for Interview Magazine, Newsday, Pank, Huffington Post, and I've recently adapted Edmund White's A Boy's Own Story into a graphic novel for Top Shelf Productions, which will be released uh, this coming fall. Additionally, I have co-edited an anthology of essays and interviews about William S. Burroughs, which will be published this summer. I am also the co-founder and editor-in-chief of the literary journal, The New Engagement. Culture Connection, curated by Daniel Zaleski and now in its eighth year at the Queens Public Library, is proud to present international artists from emerging talent to award-winning masters. These disciplines include music, theater, author talks, and film. Now expanding into a virtual format, Culture Connection is currently reaching a global audience. Thank you so much, Omar and Andre, for joining us this evening. Pleasure to be here. Thank you for having us. It means so much. Likewise. Omar, in March 16, 2021, you wrote an article in The Advocate that began, quote, I write this article in fear, fear for my country, fear for my family, and fear for myself. My parents will be shocked to read it, surely preferring I stay in the shadows and keep silent, at least for the time being, but I can't. In addition to serving as the impetus for your memoir, this article changed your life. Can you talk to us about writing it, the article in 2012 and its effect? Sure. Um, the article took a long time for me to decide to write. And then once I did to actually write it, um, it's sort of how I came out um, to everyone, including to my family. Um, you know, right after the Arab Spring, a lot of people were very optimistic. People were coming into the streets, demanding self-determination in Egypt. and people were optimistic about what this change could bring to the country. 
Um, in 2012, right after our first parliamentary elections in Egypt, a majority of the seats in parliament went to the Muslim Brotherhood and, and, and to more radical Islamic parties as well. Mm. And I think I sort of worried that we might be moving backwards instead of forwards and moving more towards an Islamic fundamentalist state even. Mm. When I thought about the legacy of my grandparents, not only were they actors, they also contribute greatly to social change in the country. My grandmother was an advocate for women's rights and my grandfather for religious minorities in the country. And so with this change and, and with the makeup of the new parliament, I sort of wanted to question the Muslim Brotherhood's um, values. They claimed they were going to be open and inclusive and a modern government. And I said, well, here's your litmus test. What are you going to do? I'm Jewish and I'm gay. How are you going to respond? And immediately a motion was brought up in parliament to re revoke my citizenship. Wow. Wow. And so your, your response to that was this, this article, which was sort of like an opening salvo, as it were, that ultimately led to um, a decade plus of activism um, and, and then ultimately this memoir. That's correct. Yeah. So there was the litmus test. It was to sort of gauge the reaction. The reaction was swift. It was more brutal than I expected because I thought my letter was was optimistic. I thought it was hopeful. You know, I was asking for nothing except inclusivity. Um, and ultimately that was denied. And did you contend um, that decision? Did you challenge it? And and what was the their response to your rebuttal, if there was one? You know, I'm not sure there's ever been an answer to that question. I know my dad mm -hmm. checks regularly with, with lawyers in the country. Um, when the military took back over after the Muslim Brotherhood left, um, everything that they sort of ruled was sort of nullified um, by the military. So oh. it's sort of an open question. Um, I suppose I would find out if I, if I went back. Um, I'm not sure it's an answer that I want to get. So for now, I'm, I'm in America and building a new home and new life. Great. And we're going to return to this. I, I want to sort of pick Andre's uh, brain a little bit. Andre, your memoir, Out of Egypt, explores your childhood in Alexandria, which is a city uh, north of Cairo, uh, where you were raised. Can you talk to us a bit about your memories of growing up there uh, as part of a Jewish family, especially your great uncle, really, and his refrain, are we or aren't we, which, <laughs> which is the whole first chapter of, uh, of your book, of your marvelous book? Well, I, I mean, my experience at the beginning was, I mean, I, I think I, I was not precocious, but I knew what was going on around us because everybody told you. In other words, they didn't keep any secrets. They didn't keep any secrets about the political situation and nobody had secrets about who's who's sort of going to sleep with Sue. Mm -hmm. We all knew it wasn't, no, everything was open. So it was a very open society. So I knew everything, but for the beginning of my childhood until from, until 1956, when I started going to school, uh, it felt as, as if I were in England. I, I wasn't in Egypt, I was in an English school. Everybody spoke English. Uh, everybody sort of was open-minded. There was no patriotism of anything. And then right after 56, when I came back after Christmas vacation, suddenly I was told that I had to learn Arabic uh, writing and, and sort of classical Arabic. And they started teaching us this. I was only five years old, but suddenly there was a change. And then gradually you began to see that the teacher who taught you ethics or values or sociology for children still was basically teaching it in Arabic, which meant that I was having a hard time understanding because I knew, and I still know sort of street Arabic and that's the extent of it. So, mm. um, but uh, and gradually I had to learn as I was going to middle school, I had to learn Arabic poems. And in those Arabic poems, they were all patriotic and they were all anti-Jewish, anti-Israel. So here I was as a kid having to learn a poem about being anti-Jewish. Wow. I was Jewish. Of course, I didn't have a smother, I mean, a, a smidgen of, of Jewish um, uh, identity. I didn't care about Judaism. I was never bar mitzvah. I refused to when they asked me. I never went to temple. I didn't care. But still, you feel that you are targeted. And eventually, it became more and more hostile as an environment to be just to be different. I was not Egyptian. I, I was born Turkish, believe it or not. And then right. I became Italian. Right. And, and be, as a foreigner, you were not welcome. So there was this whole 
anti-Western feeling in, in the country and very pro-Russian at the time. And um, at some point it was, my father's factory was nationalized. So that was another blow, a big blow, because it meant that you couldn't live there any longer. And eventually they kicked us out. They kicked me first with my mother and then my father was forced to leave as well. Your, your parents, um, as you said, they were Sephardic Jews of Turkish and then Italian um, descent. They never yeah. became um, Egyptian citizens. And is that correct? Yes, they never did. You, you, you had a choice. Uh, basically, you remained whatever you were. My father did not want to become Egyptian because that also made you subject to strict Egyptian law, and he didn't want that. So he basically had to find another nationality when once the Turkish nationality was, I don't know if it was revoked or it expired, uh, the way my Italian citizenship finally expired while I was here in the United States. Mm -hmm. So I, I felt that there was no future there, and I, I couldn't wait to leave. My parents couldn't countenance the very notion of leaving. They wanted to stay. They had a wonderful style of life, which was never reproduced. So mm -hmm. uh, they tried the best they could, but it was never going to happen. But I wanted to leave. And once I left, I regretted having left. Interesting. Um, I want to hear more about that, but I also want to get a, a little bit of a clearer picture. Your family, though, were, they were not expelled from Egypt during the 56, 57 exodus and expulsion. No. But the tensions between Israel and Egypt, the Egyptian president, um, Gamal Abdel Nasser, made it difficult and uncomfortable and tense for your family. And they eventually left in 1965? Yes, we were kicked out. We were expelled. You were expelled. We were expelled. You never know why. Because you're Jewish, because you're not Egyptian, because, because you own a factory. There's never any clear answer to those things. They just wanted to get rid. And in fact, what happened in Alexandria, unlike Cairo, is that Alexandria was immediately Arabized. In other words, the, Nasser wanted Alexandria to become sort of the hub of Arab culture, as opposed to Cairo, which remained significantly still very westernized. Interesting. Alexandria today um, is just a, it's an Arab village, as far as I know. So, Interesting, interesting. Um, and we're going to return to this in a moment. Omar, your grandfather, of course, was the trailblazer and legendary actor Omar Sharif. Um, he died in 2015 at the age of 83. Yeah, that's correct. Can you talk to us a little bit about your relationship with him and how he reacted to your article in The Advocate? Um, I was very close to my grandfather always growing up. You know, he only had one son and until late in life, my father only had one son. That was me. And so um, whenever I was on school breaks, I would spend it with my grandfather, whether we were in Egypt or in the north of France or wherever he was filming. And my father would more often than not be working. So I'd be alone with, with Omar, as I would call him. I would never call him grandfather or anything like that. Um, in the book, he's grandfather. In the book, he's grandfather. There's yeah. too many Omars otherwise. Yeah. <laughs> it gets a bit confusing. Um, yeah, so I spent my, he really, he really raised me to, to a great degree. Um, and I only have the fondest memories with him uh, in those places. You know, he was very westernized. He had a career in Hollywood for the longest time and, mm -hmm. and in Europe. Um, so, you know, diversity was nothing new to him. He didn't balk at it. I don't think you could have a successful career in Hollywood if you're not okay with Jews and you're not okay with gays. So <laughs> he had a successful career. And so... You know, my letter, while it was a surprise, um, it wasn't a bad surprise for him. And in fact, um, he never even brought it up. Our relationship never changed afterwards, which I certainly appreciated his yeah. response being that way. It sure. just made it a non-issue. That's great. Andre, you, you said earlier that you had met um, Omar Sharif once. Yes. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Uh, it was a wonderful experience. I went to a talk that he was giving with, uh, I forget, I think it's Al, Al, Al Aswani, who is another, he's a sort of, a, now a very sort of recognized. The, Yacoub, uh, the Cubian building. Yes, the Yacoubian building was his first novel. It was made into a film. And he was having a conversation with him. And the whole setup of the, the book forum at Toulouse that year was Egypt. So I was invited. And of course, there was Omar Sharif speaking with Al Aswani. And they were having a conversation. And of course, there was the style of the way that each one approached the audience, the way that each one behaved, the way that each one was dressed. Mm 
mm. sort of told you that they belong to totally different different camps, different worlds. One was sort of quite a I mean, I think Alaswani is a dentist by profession, and mm -hmm. he was more relaxed. Uh, whereas Omar Sharif was just super graceful, elegant, spoke very well his French. Um, I mean, there was a, there were two different worlds, and of course, I immediately recognized the universe that Omar Sharif came from, and I, I also knew his. I mean, I didn't know her, but I knew of her. I've seen her films, uh, Fat and Hamama. I mean, th these were wonderful actors, even in Egypt, for a long time, sure. and and so yeah. I, I sort of glommed on to him. Whereas Al Aswani was a different era, a different world, and of course, there's a lot of nostalgia in Al Aswani as well, uh, because he's trying to capture this building that has all sections of society and all kind of diverse individuals and diverse nationalities and so on. And it is an Armenian building after all in the heart of Cairo. So, um, but they were different worlds, but it was a pleasure to go up to Omar Sharif and just say, I want to shake your hand. That's, that's what you do with a star, right? Are you sure. <laughs> um, Omar, um, can you talk to us a little bit about um, your grandfather's battle with Alzheimer's? Yeah. Um, you know, I, I, I touch on this a book in my book a lot because, um, you know, as I'm sort of documenting what happened to me, I'm, I was sort of seeing someone lose a lifetime in their own mind. Mm -hmm. um, and it was super painful to watch, you know, something we saw happen over close to a decade uh, and progressively get worse. Um, and it's so hard to see someone so, so proud and with such a rich, history and legacy just sort of lose it all. Um, near the end, he became sort of angry. He could turn on a moment's notice. Um, and it was, um, it was certainly painful and, and, and a difficult time to watch. But um, thankfully, my family rallied around him and we tried to give him the best quality of life we could until the very end. Um, but, you know, as I was trying to figure out who I am, so much of my identity was wrapped up in my grandfather, um, you know, having the same name as him. Sure. Um, it, it, it was sort of like a, I was losing a part of myself, too, throughout that entire process. Yeah. I, I, I have to say, um, you write about him and his battle and your relationship with him uh, with a lot of humanity and um, affection and compassion. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Um, Andre, can you tell us a little bit about the princess and the saint and how you came <laughs> to, how they came to earn those monikers and maybe explain to our viewers who haven't read your memoir yet? Yeah, well, basically they are my two grandmothers and they came from two different classes, put it this way, or at least one thought she belonged to a higher class than the other did. The saint was humble, loving, affectionate to a fault, generous. Whereas the princess, the one that thought she was of a certain class after all, she had no money. This is the funny thing. The other uh, saint had money because her husband owned a store that was very, very successful. Whereas the princess had no money, but she had what she believed was sort of, she had the arrogance of the wealthy. Mm. And, and so she behaved accordingly. And I called her the princess because she behaved as if she were a princess, you know, she wasn't, yeah. but I like that. However, since we were talking about Alzheimer's, I saw my grandma, this is a fault of mine, which is the most horrible thing you can do to somebody with Alzheimer's, is that as I saw her in her middle nineties, she was losing her memory, she was losing her her orientation, sometimes her speech became not faulty, but it was um, un untethered and, and it wasn't quite uh, connected with what she was saying. And I was saying, look at her, she's faking it, mm -hmm. which is the first impulse you have when you have somebody who has Alzheimer's. And I did the same, do you think I learned my lesson? I did the same with my father. Mm -hmm. When he became slightly demented, I said, he's pretending that he doesn't know where he is. Uh, this, I think, is the first impulse that so many people have. I've checked. Many people have this. Why do people fake this? Is it defensive, maybe? Do you think it's defensive to protect your... Yes, yourself? but it is because you can't believe that somebody who's, I mean, like Omar Sharif, who, who's acted all these parts, who's had this very, very rich life, could suddenly basically explode the whole thing, not have it. They have to be faking. They need attention. They need some... 
course they're not. And that's the big lesson about Alzheimer's is that these people are really, so, we know this better today, sure. but, but there's a, a tendency to disbelieve them initially. Yeah. And, and I was at fault for that. So, uh, and you didn't, obviously you saw it happen. Uh, Omar, you saw it happen and mm -hmm. you wrote about it as, again, with a great deal of honesty and at the same time, a lot of affection. It, uh, no. it bring it perfect, yeah. Sure, we would make excuses for it. Uh, he would make excuses for it too. Maybe it was right. wine tonight, too many bottles of wine, or he's tired, or the sleeping pills. And so for lo for so long, you sort of ignore it, or you make excuses, or yeah. whatnot. But sadly, yeah. it's happening. Um, I want to just shift gears a moment. Uh, Andre, I just found out that the last letter the great poet James Merrill wrote to you in 1995 oh. was in praise of Out of Egypt. What an honor. Can you tell us just a little bit about that? Well, you know, uh, at the time that Out of Egypt had come out, they every time somebody sent a letter, in those days they wrote letters, they didn't send emails. So uh, I used to get a package quite often of, of letters, and I would look at them, usually in the subway, on my way to something, and I would look at the letters, and, and I saw this sort of typewritten, but it was actually printed on a computer, uh, this letter that says, you know, very nice things and named quite a few people from Alexandria. And then it was signed James, I couldn't read it, you know. <laughs> uh, I said, oh, it's, he's pretending he's James Merrill. Oh. <laughs> uh, and of course, sure enough, it was by James Merrill. And it was a lovely note. And I think he, by the time I got the letter, he was already dead. So mm -hmm. my other thought was, <laughs> imagine this, a dead man sending me a letter. No, oh, it's, not, it's not James, but it was. And it was, mm -hmm. it was actually one of the nicest letters I've ever gotten. And it was honest and forthright and full of praise. And, uh, and he, he named, one of the people he named happened to be my high school teacher of French. Oh, wow. So basically I knew this, this had to be real. It that couldn't have been made up. So, <laughs> but I had my normal sort of moment of skepticism, which I, that's part of who I am. I don't believe sure. anything you say. I think it's healthy to have a little bit of it. No, just a touch of a dash of skepticism here and there. Um, Omar, in your memoir, you very thoughtfully explore the complexities and nuances of being gay, Egyptian, um, having a Muslim father and a Jewish mother. Uh, it's a very large and intricate connection of different subjects. But can you tell us about how you have navigated the intersection of all of them? Yeah, I mean, it was always sort of natural to me to sort of straddle these these different worlds, so to speak. You know, when I was with my father's side of my family, we were very well off. They were they were famous. You know, we would travel extensively. Um, and when I was with my mother in, in Canada, we were more of a middle class Jewish family. Um, you know, it, it was really two different worlds. And then when I realized that I was gay, I was like, well, now here's a third world that I sort of have to keep hidden. And so I always sort of just tried to straddle those walls. Um, it was only later in life and as I was writing the book that I realized it's, you know, we shouldn't be straddling walls. We should be tearing them down. And that's sort of what the book's about. That's my big coming out is trying to tear down these walls between my identities and just focus on who I am holistically. That's great. My, my background is in clinical psychology and uh, I used to teach and practice. And so much of what we talk about is integration and integrating uh, various aspects or facets of identity. And that's precisely what you did. This book could be sort of a case study in that and you do it beautifully. So thank you. Um, well said, well said. How, how long did it take you to write A Tale of Two Omars? You, you described it as a painful experience. You said it wasn't it wasn't pleasurable. It was very difficult. Yeah, I'm, I'm not a writer by nature. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I'm so impressed by Andre's resume. I mean, when I look at all the, the books you've written, it, it's, it's amazing because I barely got through the one. I mean, I think the hardest thing about it was um, being honest um, and being honest in a book means being honest with yourself. Sure. And so it took me a long time to first figure out what my truth was, and then just about as long to actually put those words down on the page. So it was a long drawn out process um, that involved cynical, clinical psychologists helping me, hmm. um, very strong editors, thankfully, that I had helping me. Um, 
Counterpoint, we, right? The publisher? Yes, Counterpoint. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Um, because it, it, it took a lot of introspective work. Thankfully, it was very cathartic uh, in the end. Uh, and I'm, I'm glad I did it. But it, it's sort of sometimes hard. I, I always saw myself as a victim of circumstance, maybe. The mm -hmm. fact that I was gay, the fact that I was exiled, the fact that I was raped and then trafficked. Mm -hmm. um, but when you really do sort of that look, a lot of truths come up that, you know, you're an active participant in your life. And yes that was very difficult to actually acknowledge and then to actually write and have empathy for myself and for others around me on those pages. I, I think you really hit it on the head that it is a, the emotional experience can ultimately be cathartic and it's about confronting these difficult um, experiences and realities. Thank you for speaking so frankly about it. Um, Andre, can you talk to us a little bit about your emotional experience in writing your memoir? Uh, yeah, sure. Um, well, let, let me sort of preface what I'm going to say by saying that one of the things that I never resolved in my life, uh, even though I keep writing about it, I never resolved the fact that when I was in Egypt, I had to keep my identity secret. I was Jewish. I was at Victoria College, which had become virulently anti-Semitic. And so I was always pretending to be Christian. Mm -hmm. And uh, and I, I didn't lie that I was Christian, but I let it be inferred, which is an, an entire art in itself. So, uh, but there were moments when, for example, when I took swimming class, I was frequently, frequently uh, having a cold. So I couldn't swim because I had a cold. But the real reason is that because I couldn't get undressed in front of people mm -hmm. because I was white and I was circumcised. Right. And they would have put two and two together in a second. Mm. Oh my God, he's not a Christian. Mm. Um, and they would know that I was Jewish. And that would have set all the uh, the Arabs, because there were many Arab people from Arab countries who were at Victoria College at the time, who were basically anti-Semitic and anti-Israel, and there was never been a distinction. So, um, so writing about this was troublesome because it had to, as I'm sure it is for Omar, in order to write about this as, honestly as you can, uh, you have to unearth it. Mm -hmm. And you realize that you've been sort of stifling it for a long time. You unearth it for the book, <clears throat> you confront it by writing a book, and then you assume that it's gone, that you've resolved it. Lo and behold, a year later, it's back up again. You're yeah. still hiding it. You're still not being, for example, I mean, my best example is I'll meet somebody from France and uh, we'll speak, we'll become friendly, we'll have dinner together, everything. And it would take them about two weeks of constant meeting to tell me that, uh, oh, you know, my grandparents are Jewish. Hmm. Um, or one of my grandparents is Jewish. But it turns out when you get to know them that they're entirely Jewish. So hmm. they're not, it, again, it's this art of withholding without seeming exactly. to withhold. And I've met people from Romania, from Italy, uh, from Austria, who will not tell you right away that they're Jewish. They will sort of begin to make uh, sort of statements about it. And for me, when I uh, one of the things that I found extremely liberating being in the United States was to tell someone or let them infer however clearly as they can that I'm Jewish. It's not a secret. And this is something that I could never do in Italy. Mm -hmm. or in France when I was living in both countries, because it's the kind of thing that you don't quite say. On the other hand, if you're as paranoid as I am, mm -hmm. you're always assuming if they dislike you, it's because they figure it out <laughs> that you're not Christian. Mm -hmm. If you're paranoid, but you could be right. By uh, yeah, well, <laughs> it's, it's, an, it's an interesting context um, and how it feeds perception and of course history being so much a part of that. Um, you grew up in a household that spoke Italian, Greek, Ladino, which is an old Spanish and Arabic, and your mother was deaf, so there was also some sign language? No, my mother, no. My mother was not taught sign language because sure. good girls who are well-behaved learn to pretend they could speak yes, okay, that and was pretend memory. they could hear. Interesting. So it was just Greek, Ladino, Italian, no, it was, and, it was actually and Arabic. mostly French. French mostly was the, French. The, the language at home, then Italian, then Greek, then Arabic with, you know, the help. And there were other languages that sort of came. And, of course, English. Everybody. Ultimately yeah. English. So, but, Do you, go ahead. I'm sorry. 
No. Do you think that knowing all these languages inform how you write? I don't know. It's uh, people ask me this, and I don't know the answer. It's hard to know, right? It, it yeah. you don't know. It's like what language you dream in. I don't know. You know, I I I I, I don't know. I mean, the real answer is I don't know. Uh, it's nice to know more languages because sometimes you will have a word come to you, say in French, and you say, "What's the English word for this?" I'm an English writer. I should know. Hmm. And then you realize that the word exists in French, and when you go to Google Translate, it gives you a blank, stupid answer. So <laughs> there is no translation. So I've got to come up with something now. <laughs> so you you sort of scratch your brains, and you come up with an approximation that basically is part of the the, the art of writing. You, 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 kind of forces you to be a more rigorous thinker and writer, honestly. Maybe that's what it does. You both sent us some photos. Um, Eve, if you could throw those up. Uh, I'd love to review them and maybe you can each narrate as we do and we could start um, with Omar. So it's just the next one, Eve. Oh, I, can, I can advance it. Okay, there we go. There we go. So <laughs> we'll start with Omar. So Omar, if you wanna just tell us about what's going on in each of these photos. Well, that's my very Canadian upbringing. <laughs> Montreal Canadiens hockey uh, uniform. My uncle Holden used to take me uh, skating and to play hockey from a young age. Um, hockey was really the way my my maternal side of my family, who were immigrants from Poland after the war, after World War II, and after the Holocaust, um, sort of assimilated into mm -hmm. Canadian culture. Was was with hockey, I think, as so many families do. Um, so that was something that was really how, important. How old are you here, do you suppose? Probably four, maybe, yeah. four or five. There you go, he's fair shirt. <laughs> right after, really posing with a, yeah. I mean, it's definitely an 80s kid, you can yep. tell right there. This is the pyramids of Giza, right? Correct, yeah. Okay, and here you are with your grandfather, of course. Throughout the ages, yeah. all over the world. I, I mean, I see Rome there. I see France. Um, I see Montreal. Um, Beautiful. I love this garage. Really, really close. Thank you. And this is, <laughs> tell us the story. This was at the Oscars, right? You this and was at the Oscars. Yeah. Yeah, I was invited to um, present. I was the trophy presenter and, and invited oh, to yeah. present Best Supporting Actress with Kirk Douglas on stage, who was a surprise uh, guest at the time. Um, and originally he just said to me backstage, I was just supposed to walk him out to the microphone. And he said, I don't need your help walking. He's like, we're gonna improvise something, whatever I do, oh. just play along. And then we had this wonderful sort of That's impromptu great. moment fighting over his cane on stage. That's um, great. What year was this? 2011, this was 2011. just as People were descending into Tahrir Square maybe two yeah. weeks after that. So yeah. one of the most terrifying moments of my life, Jeez. not because on stage, but because we didn't know what was happening back home and my whole sure. family was there caught up in the Gosh. drama. Wow. Wow. Here you are again with your grandfather. That's the last photo I ever took with my grandfather. Oh, wow. Wow. Actually, we were we just completed a film in Ireland together where or by I play his grandson in the film. It's called The Secret Scripture, directed by Jim Sheridan. Oh, yeah, sure. Yeah, who uh, yeah. did My Left Foot in America in the Name of the Father. The yeah, boss. he's a great director. I have to and check so that, that was my sort of first uh, film and my grandfather's last. And we took that just before we departed ways. I went back to New York. He went to Cairo. and. Wow. As a child, he used to always play these games where we'd be animals uh, at the <laughs> dinner table, and he just suddenly did it. Uh, he already had, you know, late stage Alzheimer's by this point, and it's amazing what comes back to you. Sure, sure, very, very profound, very deep. And now here we have you with a coterie of superstars. <laughs> um, do you want to talk us through it? Sure. Uh, uh, Van Van Furstenberg. Van Van Furstenberg, who's mm -hmm. uh, become a very close friend and really helped me uh, write the memoir. I mean, mm. she's the one who, who really forced me to really look at myself and, and take a more honest approach to the writing. She said, you know, it, it's time for you to be you, step out of the shadows and just be you. Mm. Um, and it was really good advice. Um, I see Lady Gaga there. Um, I, you know, she was so nice to me the time I met her. I think she thought I was one of the members of the Hollywood Foreign Press. And <laughs> by being nice, she could win a Golden Globe. I don't know. 
but uh, she was she was super sweet. And there's Laverne Cox, Laverne the, Cox. Uh, the trans trailblazer. Yes. And we lit the Empire State Building that day, um, purple, uh, to support bullied uh, youth. Oh, and that's great. Not alone. That's so great. Uh, and your visits back to the Middle East, so Saudi Arabia at the top, which was actually a, a very eye-opening trip to me and reminded me, even after I came out, um, that I'm optimistic about the future of the region because even though Saudi often takes a step backwards, um, ultimately they're moving two steps forwards, modernizing the kingdom, changing the laws, emancipating women. Um, and so it, it leaves me a good deal of hope for our future. And it reminds me that sometimes history is one step back, two steps forward. Yeah. And then uh, Israel, Palestine, um, where I just uh, completed filming uh, the Baker and the Beauty, which is uh, the number one hit show in Israel, uh, oh, yeah. and it's out on Keshet right now. Okay, that's great. Yeah. These are great. Thank you. And then here we have you. I mean, I see my, my my life sort of like I see Jerusalem with those quadrants. Hmm. You know, there's the Armenian, the 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 Christian, the Muslim, the Jewish. Um, but at the end of the day, it's just a, such a special place if you look at it and it's holistically, but also in its, its its pieces are just special too. And so it's mm. just a hopeful place for me. That's great. And here we have you in action and activism. Or at the top, I think it's right after Trump announced the Muslim ban mm. um, at a protest rally in New York. Uh, at the bottom, it's in Amsterdam at the, uh, the International AIDS Conference, the largest conference for uh, HIV AIDS in the world where I am seated a couple years ago. That's great. Yeah. And then finally, this is a photo by our mutual friend, Yuri. Yuri Devias. Yes, and this was for the um, the Advocate article, right? It accompanied the, am I right? Am I correct in that? I believe, so. I believe it, it was used in that. Yeah, I look at that. Wow. I mean, a great shot. Yeah, I'm youth, right? I mean. <laughs> You look exactly the same. I'm going to go the right now. I don't know. <laughs> Stop. <laughs> okay. And now, Andre, your turn. Oh. Oh, this is me. I, I was very, very unhappy in those days. I was in my first or second year at Victoria College. I only stayed there two years. And I was miserable. My father was having an affair with various women. And he thought I hated him and I didn't, I idolized him. Uh, but at the same time, he was not nice to me. And so he took us to, to the photographer and asked us to smile. And it looks pretty persuasive, I have to say. Great I must have been a very happy child. I wasn't, I was miserable. Oh, I was know, failing yeah. all the classes, yeah. um, unhappy at home, terribly unhappy at home, and certainly not happy in the streets of Egypt. So it was not a good place. How old do you suppose? I'm probably 10. Okay. There we, there oh, you this, are again. Yeah, this is the last picture that was taken of me in Egypt. I was 14 years old. Um, I'm still unhappy. Uh, it's. I remember I wrote about this picture and my father was telling me, um, you know, stand up, stand straight, hold yourself. Safe. Well, I was always sort of lax and and sort of flummoxed a bit. And he was always insisting that I be manly which was not my forte, mm. but uh, there I am trying to hold your tummy in. I had a tummy and, and so hold it in and stay straight. And so there I am s trying to smile. Thankfully, I have the sun in my eyes, so I'm wincing, ah. which is the best thing I could do. Okay, that's great. Thank you. Oh, <laughs> this is me at the age of what, two and a half? No, actually I must've been four. Okay. And uh, there's another picture, a companion picture with me and my brother. And uh, there it is. Look, I'm looking miserable. Uh, I think I got quite spanked by my mother for the picture. Take a picture. We want to take a picture. And I didn't want to. I didn't want anything. I, did, I was always negative on everything. So here I am, having just gotten smacked, trying to look sort of happy or whatever it is. And obviously, I look absolutely miserable. <laughs> Oh, are, this is a collection now. It's a little yeah. bit. Okay. Well, this is uh, the one at the top, in the middle top is, this was the cook for my grandmother, the, the saint. And he was extremely nice to me. And I mean, and I used to love 
to sit in the kitchen and hear all the servants talk among themselves or with neighboring servants. I used to love that because it was it was always foul. They were always saying dirty things, <laughs> which I loved. And of they course. were gossiping. <laughs> and I love gossip. I mean, gossip for me is history. Sure, um, sure. Oral history. And he was and here I am sort of caressing the dove that he's about to slit its throat. Oh my gosh. Us, you know, so um, it's just a different world, but I, I I liked him a lot. He was very nice to me. And this is me at a restaurant, uh, sort of a kind of, um, uh, what do you call it? It's sort of a deli kind of place, simple place. And my father was ordering food. My father and my mother never went out together. They were always separate. Mm. So I'm with my father. I'm trying to behave. I know exactly what's going in my head. I'm going to try to take a picture. I have to look charming. He wants me to look charming. Uh, I'm going to look so self-possessed as it were. Yeah. And uh, and I'm taking a picture. It's all fake and I can tell <laughs> you. But you asked for pictures. So I said yeah. <laughs> I love how sort of precocious you were as a kid. Very um wise beyond your years. Oh, this is my mother, and this yeah, is my parents sure. getting married. You can tell that my mother is radiant, yeah. and my father is all pinched as in, why did I do this? <laughs> uh, because he regretted it a week after he got married. And Was this in Egypt? In Egypt, yes. This is in the big synagogue in Egypt, where, in fact, you will see, on if you're on Facebook about nostalgia Egypt, you will see that every Jew, when they get married, go to exactly to the same synagogue and they always have these balusters in the background of the uh what is it the hanavi uh whatever it's called the daniel the the, the prophet daniel's synagogue that's what it is and uh and that's what it is and the other one on top is my mother when she was young she was very beautiful and she knew it too what yes yeah, stunning what what years do you think can you place these yeah roughly? they're 1947 1947. Yeah. Uh, oh, and this is my family. This is the princess. This okay. is the princess with her sister and her mother. Now, my, that's my grandmother and my great grandmother. Her, the great grandmother is celebrating her hundredth birthday. Mm. It is a very sort of important date in the history of the family, and she's there. She's her, her. She's got all her marbles. She's not a stupid Gaga woman. She's absolutely present, and there she is by herself taking a picture. A very vain and not very nice woman. Mm. And the bottom picture is one of her sons, and my mother is in it next to her cousin by marriage. And some of the elder people in the family all posing as if you have a sense that they're pretending to be aristocrats. They're not. Mm -hmm. they're, they're actually nothing. Mm -hmm. it's, it's all uh, fakery and fainting. Pageant, pageantry, yeah. 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 Well, thank you. Thank you for that very honest assessment. And this is a great shot. Whoops. There it goes. Oh, no, this is this is the same family. My 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 the saint is in this picture, her mother's in this picture, obviously younger. And when you look at this picture. It's taken at the villa of one of her uh, son-in-laws. And you look at the picture, and you, there was one thing that you has to cross your mind. They're all dead. Mm. You know, there's, it's, it's, it's one of it. Like, Aunt Elise, dead. Aunt yeah. Jojo, dead. Aunt, Aunt, Uncle Albert, dead. They're all dead. As the Proust, I'm quoting Proust, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So-and-so so dead. So-and-so so dead. They're all dead. Yeah. And, and yet the picture remains, and you say, my God, what happened? Uh, there is no answer, of course. Wow. The power of, uh, of memory, you know? Thank you, both of you, for, for, for those uh, narrations. Um, you could take the slideshow down now. Thank you so much. Oh. Um, Omar, you write with a good deal of clarity about the Arab Spring in 2011, as you were saying at the top of the program, and the rise of the Muslim Brotherhood, which uh, I recently found out is an organization that actually dates back to 1928 and how it impacted you. Um, you said a good deal about it. Can you talk about how it sort of continues to inform um, your worldview or your your sort of day-to-day -day existence as it, or have you sort of been able to shake it all loose since the memoir? Um, I don't think I'll ever shake it fully loose. I got my master's degree in, in conflict studies from the London School of Economics. Um, and one of the things I, I was really studying while I was there was what is revolution? Um, 
and I think while the Muslim Brotherhood was was coming to power and, and people were sort of coalescing around certain shared goals, um, I think what I realized was that revolution is certainly um, personal. You know, it, it's a father who wants to better provide for their family. It's a mother who wants more rights and freedoms and opportunity for her daughters. Um, you know, for me, it was wanting to come out and live openly and authentically. Um, different personal motivations and yet a collective of people coming together, uh, trying to create structural and social change. Mm -hmm. um, but personal, it, it's individual. Revolution is actually individual and not yep. societal necessarily. Yep. Yep, I agree um, with that. And so when I saw the Muslim Brotherhood uh, coming, coming to power in Egypt, um, and I, we look back at, at all of Andre's beautiful photos of, of old Egypt, and you see how almost secular and modern Egypt seem with the women and their hair uncovered and wearing, you know, avant-garde clothing for the time. Um, you know, we sort of saw it moving sort of backwards instead of forwards, turning into a monolithic entity instead of the co beautiful cosmopolitan Egypt that that Andre so vividly describes and that my grandparents would tell me about from before the years of Nasser. Um, and so now that they're out of power, um, they're always looming in the shadows, the Muslim Brotherhood, um, but the military hasn't necessarily turned the clock back um, from before they came to power. And so you question, you always question, how much longer this will go on for? Is it cyclical? Um, will 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 hmm. will we keep sliding downwards the slippery slope towards fundamentalist state, or is there a way to turn this back around in a globalized world? I, don't know. I was I was telling you, and thank you for that very thoughtful uh, intellectual uh, assessment. Um, I visited Egypt when I was a kid, when I was 22 in 1999. It was a, a gift I gave myself for graduating college with honors. Um, and it was one of my most fond memories. I think about it all the time. You were telling me that I probably wouldn't recognize a lot of it now, only 22 and a half years later. Can you, can you? Right, every time, uh, just to give you a, an example, you know, gr growing up whenever I'd be in Egypt in the eighties or nineties, a majority of women, women wouldn't cover their heads. They wouldn't be veiled. Um, now, if you go to Egypt, just a decade or two decades later, 90 to 95% of, of, of women are, are veiled in Egypt. Mm. Um, it just goes to show that the immense social change that's happening as it becomes more and more of an Islamic or adherent uh, and less and less of a secular sort of society. Um, I want to shift gears again a little bit. You said at the top of the program, you spoke a bit about the um, the, the abuse that you, you wrote about uh, extensively in, in one of the chapters of your memoir. Uh, I was very disturbed by your employment with the shake of the Gulf Cooperation Council and the subsequent um, abuses. For our viewers who have not yet read your book, would you be able to summarize and speak more about that really harrowing experience? Sure. Um... You know, I think I didn't have at the time empathy for myself. Um, I don't know that I necessarily thought I deserved better than what I was receiving. And so, um, you know, I was in the closet at the time when this happened and I didn't reach out for help to family members and this and that. And the truth is the closet doesn't protect LGBTQ people. It protects the predators that prey mm -hmm. on us so many times. Because when you're afraid to reach out for help or to tell people what's going on, um, you find yourself in these awful positions at time with nowhere to turn to. Yeah. Um, and so you endure some of these abuses that anyone could see you should be running away from or trying to escape from much sooner than you, you realize yeah. yourself. Um, so there were many times during this episode of, you know, close to a year when I was fearful of my life, when other people that were sort of, I don't want to say in captivity with me, but were dying in my arms. Um, it was a very frightening time of my life, not knowing what tomorrow would bring or what the next hour would ever bring. Um, 
And I think the message that I would share with people is that if that could happen to me as the grandson of the two most famous people Egypt's ever produced, it could happen to anyone. Yeah. Um, so allow people the space to be open and honest with who they are so that they don't find themselves in a predicament when they, where they feel like they can't reach out for help when yes. they need it. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Um, can you tell us a little bit about your activism and advocacy work that you've done for, for GLAD, the Gay and Lesbian Alliance Against Defamation? You were the national spokesperson from 2013 to 2015. That's correct. correct. Yeah. I mean, I was looking for an organization that would help me change society back home in Egypt. And I quickly realized that uh, media is the United States' largest global export. Um, and if we could sort of change the culture in America through visibility and representation, um, while many people don't have roofs on their homes in Egypt, they do have satellite dishes somehow. Uh, and these images and words do manage to get in. And by seeing more progressive plot lines and characters and more fair reporting, um, I thought maybe I could help to effectuate change back home and, and, and create a more accepting society. It's a very powerful tool. Um, Eve, would you mind putting up the link for the, uh, the Elizabeth Taylor AIDS Foundation? I know that that's one of the charities that are near and dear to your heart. Um, and for our viewers who would like to learn more about the Elizabeth Taylor AIDS Foundation and perhaps donate, um, we will be putting a link up shortly. Oh, actually, I also have access to it, so I could throw it up. Um, I mean, oh, there it goes. It was remarkable in that, you know, she would speak out when when few others would at the time that were very high profile when and the problem continues and the problem continues in the middle east too because the first thing we need to do is reduce the stigma so people could talk about hiv and aids and sadly that's not happening in the middle east right now and 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 the epidemic is only growing in that region so um it, it's a it's a cause that's certainly near and dear to my heart and something that i don't see other people speaking about in the region so that's great. Well, thank you for doing that work. Um, in 2019, you made a public challenge to the Sultan of Brunei uh, after he passed a law to stone homosexual people. Can you talk to us about that? Yeah. So that's something that I I, I think I, I, I regret in many ways. Um, I was on a flight home from Doha to Los Angeles at the time when I saw the news that that Sharia law would be implemented and they would be stoning uh, gays and adulterers. And I, I knew the Sultan's son um, and I knew he was gay. And so I sort of just tweeted in, in a fit of haste and maybe some sleeping pills and alcohol mixed together too, that I volunteer myself second to be stoned according to the new LGBT anti-LGBT law, if the Sultan's son is first and the Sultan cast the first and last son wow. himself. Wow. Um, of course, yeah. immediately it went viral and went global. Newspapers were reporting on it. I'd essentially outed uh, one of the princes in Brunei, yeah. which is not my place to do that. I, you never know what sort sure. of predicament someone else is in or what situation. Sure. Um, that prince died last year, a year and a half ago under fairly suspicious circumstances, mm -hmm. no one okay. really knows. And I sort of every day question and wonder if I contributed in any way to that. So it's something that I lose sleep over. So. Th thank you for being honest um, and open about that. I, I, I appreciate it. Um, Andre, <clears throat> again, we're shifting gears once again. There's so many topics and subjects that I wanted to cover in this hour. Um, of course, um, James Ivory won the Academy Award for Best Adapted Screenplay for Call Me By Your Name in 2018. What did you think about his script and Luca Guadagnino's film in general? I thought, basically, um, when I met the two of them, they came, they came to, to meet me together in a cafe. And we had a wonderful co talk conversation with each other. They were very courteous, very nice, the whole thing. And at some point, Guadagnino said, you know, that scene that takes place in Rome, we might shorten it a bit. I said, listen, I've already had my say. You do with the story whatever you feel like. 
which is sort of an honest answer. He says, well, actually, we're going to shorten it significantly. Yeah. I said, again, do what you want. I, I, it doesn't matter to me. Frankly, he added, we're going to eliminate the scene altogether. <laughs> I said, that's fine too. Do, <laughs> do what makes the movie hold. Sure. And I think the movie does hold. It holds together very well. There is one thing only that I asked them to fix, and they did right away, is that in the script that James Iver had written, there are many scenes in which the parents begin to have suspicions that something is going on between, you know, Elio and Oliver. Mm -hmm. There are Something's not right. Plus, says the mother at another conversation, you know, there's this new disease among gays, and do you think we should worry? Then at some point, the two are in the, by the swimming pool, and the parents are there, and she sort of nudges her husband, says, look, look, something is going on. And I said, you can't have any of that. The parents must not know. If they know, the audience doesn't know they know. Hmm. Said, because if you're going to have a major moment when the father speaks to the son, oh, yeah. no one has to know that the father knows. Yeah. And the son, as the father is talking to him, the son says, well, yeah, we were good friends. And the father says, no, you were more than just good friends. And so the father insists on basically opening the door, opening the closet, as it were, saying, I could have had that. It never happened. And, and so... I, I was right. That, that was the only intrusion into the script that I had. Most of the script was changed by um, Luca Guadagnino, and I think he made the right decision each and every time. That that scene at the end with his father, with Elio and his father, I think I don't. I, say, I think I speak for millions of gay men yeah. <laughs> when I say that it was uh, it winded me. You know. Well, I think a lot of you have to realize that. It's easy for somebody to say, you know, I'm going to come out to my parents. I've read this book. I'll come out to my parents. And it's a young kid. But mm -hmm. think of somebody who's 80. Yeah. And a lot of people who are 70 and 80 wrote to me at the time wow. saying, my father's long gone. I never had the opportunity to tell him anything about my sexual orientation. Uh -huh. It never happened. It never would have happened, even if I wanted to, because it was a different universe at that time. So I, I realized that I, I never wrote that scene with any kind of mission statement. That's not the kind of writer I am. Um, but at the same time, I know it has affected a lot of people. Yeah, and that's... it's so well acted. Yeah, it's, it's better it's... acted than it is actually written. So oh, I, I don't know about that. It, it's marvelously acted and it's marvelously written. Um, Omar, you've seen the film. Have you read Andre? Did you read Andre's book? I haven't read the book. I, I you've saw seen the, the film, of course, and you were talking a bit about it earlier. Yeah. And yeah. What are your thoughts? I mean, it certainly touches on how so I, I thought it was so honest. I mean, I, I spent my summers in, in Europe always growing up and, you know, having these little secret hidden love affairs. Um, but you sort of wish that the door would have been opened for me earlier to be able to talk honestly with my family about it. Um, and so it was definitely, definitely moving. I just want to say to our viewers that we'll be taking questions for Omar and Andre in a few minutes. So please start to send them in. Um, Omar, your acting career seems to be picking up steam in the last decade. You didn't always want to be an actor, though, right? Despite your grandfather being a star and the most famous actor in Egypt. What brought you to that decision and how old were you? Yeah, I, you know, number one, I wasn't encouraged to be an actor because I think my grandparents saw the difficulties that that it led to in their lives with with being so such public figures. I mean, both of them essentially were exiled from Egypt before I was. Also during Nasser's years, they they had to leave. Um, they never really had the time for to raise their family the way they probably would have liked. Um, and they never had the degrees of privacy if they ever wanted to, to do things with their families. Um, and so I think they wanted more for me than that. On my end, um, since I was hiding so much who I was authentic on the inside, the last thing I wanted was an added spotlight on me. You know, I already had so much bouncing off my grandfather onto me that made it difficult to sort of, or I thought made it difficult for me to hide who I was when I was still uh, not out. Um, I certainly didn't want that extra spotlight. Um, but at the end of the day, it's 
what I love to do. Thankfully, I've been getting some great roles right now that really do speak to some of the issues that I'm so passionate about uh, uh, and, and are such great uh, examples of representation and visibility in media. And I think we, I spoke earlier about how I was always trying to straddle these, these walls between these, between these different worlds that I inhabited. And, you know, nothing tears through those walls better than art. I, and I so completely agree. Yep. I'm finally, finally embracing that opportunity. Um, in the Baker and the Beauty, I play a, a Palestinian who's in love with an Israeli and we have a child, an Israeli Jew, and we have a child uh, together via surrogacy. Um, you know, all, all sort of new subjects on, on his, in Israeli media. Um, so it's certainly doing its, its piece there. So the more I could find roles like that, the, I think the more I'm going to be able to sort of fulfill, um, my desire to sort of break down those walls and stop compartmentalizing myself. Yeah. It's, it's really liberating to be able to, to integrate that way. What I want to know what your closest friends and family members thought of your memoirs, Omar and Andre. What kind of feedback did you get from your inner circle once they were published? Well, I, I can tell you two things. One is one of my uncles said, you said that your mother was a Tarsha, which is deaf woman. Oh. Shame on you. But <laughs> basically, there's nothing wrong with deafness. You right, know? right. But for him, it was deaf. Another like family, uh, Uncle Vili's relatives uh, said, you know, what you said about our father is extremely, extremely bad. Mm. Uh, we're thinking of, we're going to sue you. And oh I my said, God. please do. <laughs> it would be fantastic publicity for my, oh my book. <laughs> they never sued. They never sued. Yeah. How about you, Omar? Um, my family, I, I think they took it. I think it was very difficult for them to read some of the things that I went through because I had kept them secret for so long. And um, even to myself, you know, I would brush everything off that happened to me. I'd, I'd make a punchline out of it, make a quick joke and, and move on to the next subject. Um, but for them to read truly what happened in the, in the Middle East and whatnot, um, and knowing that I didn't feel comfortable going to them for help, I think really hurt them. And they found that very difficult. We have some questions from our viewers. Hello, Omar. Besides being Egyptian and Canadian, you have another identity too, because you're pretty much a boy from Ipanema. Oh my goodness. Tell us how Brazil has touched you. Um, yeah, I mean, <laughs> I guess well, I, someone's on my Instagram, I guess. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I've been spending some time in Brazil lately. Um, it's such a beautiful country. Um, and I feel truly free there. There's something about the 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 spirit of, of the people there where, where everything is sort of accepted and tolerated and out in the mm -hmm. open. Um, and I just feel truly free when I'm there. That's great. Um, thank you both so much for such a candid, meaningful interview. Can you both share about some future projects for 2022 and beyond? That was actually going to be my last question, but I'm giving it to this viewer. So what, pro what projects are you both working on? What can we expect from both of you? You go ahead, Omar. <laughs> oh, well, um, I'm excited because I currently have um, a three-project television development deal. So oh, wow. um, there'll be some news coming out about that soon. And I'm oh, certainly wow. excited to share it because, again, it touches on everything that's important to me, including representation and visibility. So, Can you say if it's for an American or a European or Egyptian production company? Is it? It's, it's with two different American studios. Okay, yeah. I won't push anymore. I won't pry any further. I'll look forward to the, to the news. Um, thank you, Andre? Well, I have three novellas that are currently in Audible right now, and they eventually, I'm sure, will be published on paper. They're out in Italy on paper, but not in the United States yet. And I'm working on another memoir. Okay, I actually was gonna ask you both about that too. Omar, another memoir? No, never. You're done. <laughs> not, actually, but uh, not for the time being. It, it took a lot out of me. I mean, I, I have such respect for Andre, who keeps going back to uh, and, and sharing such stuff. But uh, I, I don't know that I have it in me. Great. I want to thank you both so much for this evening. It's really been a gift um, and a pleasure. 
Thank you, Brian. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you, Omar. Really lovely meeting you here. Thank you, I hope to see you both soon in New York one day. Okay, you can always write to us. Thank you. <laughs> Have a good evening, everybody. Thank you for watching. Bye, everybody. Thank Bye. You. Take care. Bye.